Hello everyone, my name is Marcel. I'm a PhD student in the Computer Vision and Geometry Group at ETH. And I'm going to talk a bit about our project on privacy preserving structure for motion. This was done with Peter Larsen from our group, Pablo Speciale and Johann Schönberger from Microsoft and Mark Poliface. And it also builds on some previous work done by Pablo, Johannes and Mark together with Sudita Sina at Microsoft. Now, to give some motivation why we want to do this in the first place, what we eventually want to support is those mixed reality applications where we can place virtual content in the real world and then observe it consistently with different devices. This uses some scene representation that we can use to find correspondences between what the devices are observing and this representation. And from this we can estimate the device pose and consequently render the virtual content correctly in the background image. So assuming we have our pre-built map and the devices start localizing in there, what Structure for Motion now enables us to do is that instead of only performing the localization task and then throwing all the data away, is that we use it to also extend the map. So we can, for example, uh, increase the area that is covered but what is even more important is that we can use the data to update existing parts of the map to represent changes in the environment. So if we would keep our map static all the time and the environment changes, at some point we wouldn't be able to localize anymore. But if we consistently update it to keep track of any changes, this should work for a much longer time. Now the problem for us is that there are two important differences between this application and how we use structure for motion before. So first of all, um, while we used to have some powerful computers so we could do all the processing, mixed reality is usually done with portable devices, which obviously have a very limited computation power. So instead of being able to performing all the localization, everything directly on the device, we have to capture the data, send it to a server that does the heavy processing and then sends back the pose. And the second difference is actually the way how the data is captured. So let's say if we just want to use structure for motion to build a nice model of some object, we can explicitly capture data for that purpose and we make sure that all the viewpoints are covered. But we can also make sure that there is not a lot of information in the images that we don't want to have in our model eventually. And a slightly different way is in the research context where we use crowdsource data sets for large-scale scene reconstruction. And those are usually collected from some websites where people can upload their pictures. But the important part is that all those images were still like, uh, they still explicitly capture some part of the scene. And then they were explicitly shared by uploading them to this website. Whereas in our mixed reality setup, the devices basically just need to capture the environment when they need to localize and the users cannot really decide to not share any data with the server without limiting the functionality because if we don't share this information we cannot localize and therefore we don't have mixed reality. So it's very likely that the server gets some information that is not really supposed to be shared. Now obviously we don't share the raw images with the server. That's not even for privacy reasons, but just for technical reasons, because there are intermediate representations that are much more convenient to work with. So what we do is that we extract key points in the image and then we assign descriptors that encode the appearance of a small image pad around that key point and also add some invariance to changes like illumination. But it turns out that those features can be inverted and especially with modern methods like neural networks, we can reconstruct the original images pretty well. So to avoid this, we use a privacy preserving feature representation. And our version of this is somehow orthogonal to the privacy preserving feature descriptors in the sense that instead of adding uncertainty in the descriptor space, we add it in the feature geometry. And we do this by lifting the key points to lines and then we can keep the original feature descriptors. So we construct these lines by taking the original key points 
and selecting a random orientation. And then we just shift the line so that it uh, passes through the key point with our random orientation. And then the server never sees the original key points. It only knows it's somewhere on this line that we send them. Now changing the feature geometry obviously also changes the geometric constraints that we get from this. So while a key point in the image unprojects to a line or array in 3D, the line unprojects to a 3D plane. And to show the difference that this makes for the feature inversion, here on the left you see again the image that is reconstructed from key points, and on the right is the image that the server could reconstruct from our queries. So this is not a reconstruction of the image, because the current feature inversion methods cannot really work with lines as inputs. And so the only thing that we can do is that we find the correspondences with the map and then project the map points into the image and use those as key points. So as a consequence, this is only a reconstruction of the part of the map that is observed by the image. So now onto our structure for motion pipeline. And the overall structure is actually the same as for classical SFM. So if we start from scratch and don't have any map at all, we need some initialization. And once we have some image poses, we can run point triangulation, pose estimation and bundle adjustment in a loop uh, to iteratively build up the map. But since we have uh, different constraints, so different feature geometry, we obviously need to update all of those models to work with the new constraints. So starting with the triangulation and in the key point setup we would basically just have two images with key points, unproject those to 3D lines and then try to find the intersection. And in practice there is usually no intersection but rather we find the point where the distance between those two lines is minimal and this gives us on the one hand the 3D point, but also we can look at this distance to basically validate the triangulation. So if it's too large, then it's likely that this is just a wrong feature match and it doesn't really represent a proper 3D point. Now with our feature lines, this is a bit more complicated because obviously we can take two images and then unproject the two lines, but this will give us 3D planes and they will only intersect in a line and not a point. So this is obviously not enough information. And only by adding a third image, we can then intersect all three planes and this will give us a point. But still, um, for the three planes, they will always intersect in a point and we don't have any way to check if this triangulation is in any way reasonable. So what we need to do is to also add a fourth image and then we can finally compute the distance between the triangulated point and this fourth plane. So then we get an idea if the triangulated point is in any way reasonable. Now for pose estimation the idea is actually very similar. So we try to find a setup where we have a minimal distance between the map points and the unprotected planes. Now with the lines we obviously have additional degrees of freedom compared to the key point case. And therefore we need six correspondences just to estimate the image pose and seven correspondences if we also want to estimate the focal length. And the bundle adjustment is actually very similar to the standard case. So we just take the 3D point and project it to the image and instead of computing the distance between the projection and the key point, we just compute the distance between the projection and the line. And this setup has the benefit that we can use much more complex camera models here. So for example, we can also add radial distortion and then update these parameters together with the image poses and the structure. So the initialization step is actually the most complex part of this whole pipeline. And as I said before, we already need four images to get some meaningful point triangulation. And this problem doesn't really get easier if we have to estimate the image positions or image poses on top of that. And it turns out this is still possible with four images, but we need to break the problem down a little bit to make it simpler. And we start by making the observation that if our images are all horizontally aligned and our feature lines are vertical instead of random, then the problem is basically invariant to any changes in the vertical component and we can simply ignore that for now. 
Now what we can do is, instead of only extracting key points in the image and then constructing our line features from that, that we also detect lines in the image and then we use those to estimate the vanishing point. And this vanishing point allows us to do two things. So first, we can compute a transformation that transforms the features in the image into a new synthetic image that is horizontally aligned. And second, we can establish a new kind of features where we don't use a random line orientation, but instead we construct a line that it passes through the original key point and through the vanishing point. And those features will be perfectly vertical in the synthetic image. So during feature extraction, we just randomly decide for each feature if it should be randomly oriented or vertically aligned. And then for this first step in the initialization, we focus on feature tracks where all features uh, in the all four images are vertical. So now we can ignore the height component and just solve the 2D problem, which is obviously much easier. And for this, we use three images to estimate the tri for potential. Uh, then we can use that to triangulate 2D points and then register the last image to this 2D map. And when we have images with unknown focal length, we could try to estimate this here as well, but this turned out to be pretty challenging, so we do something else instead. And for this we again switch to a different kind of feature tracks. So instead of using four vertical lines, we now are looking for tracks where we have vertical lines in two images and randomly oriented lines in the other two. And from this, since we know now all the image poses in 2D, we can triangulate the 2D point from the vertical lines and just extend this to 3D, which will give us a vertical line, and project this into the other two images. And for each of those, we now have the vertical projection plus the randomly oriented line for the same feature, and we can simply reconstruct the original key point by intersecting those two. And you could say this kind of breaks our privacy-preserving representation, but actually once we have the image poses, we could triangulate the 3D point from this feature track anyway, and then just get the key point by projecting that back into the image, so there's not really any additional information revealed by explicitly reconstructing the key points here. Then we repeat this for all suitable feature tracks, and what we end up with is a set of key point correspondences between those two images, which is just the same as if we had done standard key point extraction and matching. So now we don't just do this for a single pair, but instead for all possible pairs of images within this initialization set. And what we end up with is actually a sufficient input to just perform a standard global structure for motion algorithm. And as a first step to do this, we estimate fundamental matrices. Afterwards, we can then use a graph optimization to go from the pairwise constraints that we get from the fundamental matrices to globally consistent image rotations and focal length. And as a last step, we also estimate globally consistent image positions. And for this, we already switch back to the feature lines, again, instead of the reconstructed key points, just to avoid any errors that we might have introduced um, during this key point reconstruction stage. And to show some results with this, here on the left, we have a model reconstructed with standard structure for motion with key points. In the center, there is the privacy preserving version where we know the camera calibrations. And on the right, we have a version where we also do self calibration of all the cameras. And you can see the reconstruction quality is actually very similar for all three methods. Um, the one big difference that we have with the privacy preserving versions is that we have much less triangulated points, which is mostly just because we need four images for triangulation and therefore we lose all the feature tracks uh, with only two or three images. So if you want to know more about this, we also have a project page where we have the papers online and also the videos from ECCV last year and I will also try to answer any questions.